I, I, I want to make this point explicit. I mean, it's, it's implied, but I want to make it explicit. When we talk about inclusion, a lot of times it tends to get siloed into segments, right? So it's inclusive teaching, so you're talking about that in the classroom. It's inclusive science communication or inclusive in K-12. And, and really what we're talking about, um, and my colleague Sarah was saying that this morning, is it's really about just inclusion as human beings, right? And you will find that as we describe our different contexts, we're describing the same phenomenon but at different scales, all right? I will talk a little bit about what it means in the, in the higher ed context, or at least more specifically in the classroom, the student voice. And um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Ortiz, will talk about uh, at the scale of an entire institution, and Dr. Bouquet will talk about some work at, at NOAA. So I wouldn't, I'm not going to introduce them to you when they come to give you their own backgrounds. Um, a little bit about me, all right? Um, I like to situate myself in this stuff. I'm originally from the Caribbean. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I like to say that up front because my accent is still kind of thick. And you know, people do that thing I, the students do to me when I teach. They nod me along. It's like, you don't, you don't understand what I'm saying, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't get that. It's cool. You know, I, you know it's, it's all right. Um, so I, I try to really work on my enunciation. But at times, I may kind of chew a word or get too excited. Uh, but I did come to America. Um, to, uh, for college, so legally. Um, um, <laughs> you never know where ICE is. Um, and um, I had a, a kind of a pathway heading towards uh, classical marine biology research scientist. And then one day I was given the opportunity to, to be in a classroom when everybody around me was telling me to avoid it as much as I could. And in that classroom, I found what I think was my calling. And uh, so that turned into really asking some interesting questions around research and teaching, which led to this current position. So I teach intro bio and a couple other classes. But my research program basically studies the social context of learning. So we look at everything from inclusive, sorry, um, <coughs> implicit bias to social belonging, um, science communication in uh, the general public. We've taken on questions about privilege and how people interpret that. Um, and I just want to spend a few minutes right now with you to talk about why this matters for our context, right? And these few slides really comes out of a lot of conversations that I have when I go to campuses around the country. And I get a lot of fragility, right? I get a lot of defensiveness, and I get a lot of, that happened so long ago, or it wasn't me. And and there's, there's, not a, there's not a really full understanding of how things that have been slowly built up over the years, how they've come to um, have consequences that still matter in the current day. All right? So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of, of, of why it matters. And then, and then the other second point I just want to make really quickly is there's another movement that is grinning a groundswell right now that is bothering me quite a bit, and that's the anti-coddling movement, I call them. And there's this sense that the college students today are too soft and they're too, you know, too radical and, and they, can't, you know, they can't take offense easily. To be fair, I think there's truth to both sides of the argument, but what happens when I read a lot of these, these pieces is there's no engagement into why people are offended in the first place, right? There's no engagement into the situational context. There's this kind of highfalutin elitist, well, if only you just read the great books and, and you know, uh, treated university like how I did when I was there in the 60s. So anyway, I won't, um, <laughs> won't go off on that tangent, but so the term social belonging is not um, a new term. All right, we, we decided to call it that somewhere in the 70s when they did immigration research in Spain. But the idea of there's an us and there's a them has really been around since there was an us and a them. So say once there's a main society and another group who had to figure out how to integrate within that main group, um, that them, right, became the group that had to figure out how they, how they had to belong. So in 1912, it was Jews. This is a quote from the then president of Harvard University making an argument as to why they should restrict the admission of Jews into Harvard. All right, so his successor, Charles Eliot, you know, had a very different feeling about that. 
but it's not really that long ago, <laughs> okay? And um, I like to make that point because sometimes the, the, the thinking or the assumption is that places of higher education will immune or separate from some of the social um, fractiousness that was going on in white America in the 1900s. A more radical example, all right, this is Cornell University. Um, I think around mid-1940s. And um, so a group of black students took over the student union and demanding that the institution pays more attention to um, having classes that relate to their culture, that having spaces that make them feel a sense of belonging. Um, you will notice that they're armed and that was because after the first night of protests, a white fraternity attacked them and so they, in order to protect themselves, they got guns. No, no shots were fired, but this, this event ended in a, um, a promise, a written document by the president of the university to hire more African American professors, um, create more classes, the, the usual list of how we respond to these things. Right. And you flash forward about 60 years, and you have these young men at the University of Missouri who decided that they will not play another game of football unless the issues of race and belonging are addressed. All right, the significance of their shirt, 1839 was built on my black, it signifies the fact that the campus was, part of the campus structure was helped build by former slaves. Right? And I, I know these are, I'm, I'm, I've picked sort of two examples of this, and I'm not saying that every campus in America that's majority white, the students of color feel this way. But if over half a century later you have students across the country basically making the same argument, then it at least should give you some pause. And uh, while it is, is perfectly okay to recognize the progress we have made on many of these issues, it is also a professional responsibility to figure out the places where we haven't and the consequences of that, all right? Officially, the term is defined as, well, there are actually many definitions, but this is probably one of my favorites. That the sense of personal involvement that you have in a social system, right? So that you feel indispensable and integral. A colleague of mine likes to compare it to being a guest in someone's house, which I hope everyone in this room has had the experience <laughs> of being a guest in someone's house, or, or vice versa. And you realize there's a difference between being a guest and actually living there. So if you're a guest, you know, you get fed, <laughs> right? You, you get a room to sleep in and, you know, a place to shower, etc. But you don't get to pick what the meals are going to be. You don't get to pick, you know, what time uh, we leave the house and on what activities the house engages in. You're a guest, <laughs> right? You're allowed to be here, but you don't get to change your music. And where sense of belonging, uh, I think the difference between just having students of color on campus versus actually having them being an integral part of the power structure is the degree to which you're actually including their voices in the way you design your syllabi, in the way you design your campus, in your mission statement, and not waiting for, for diversity week to have all these conversations. There are real consequences to this. This book is a little bit dated, it came out in 2000. But I can tell you that the authors are um, doing a second version of it, and I'm a bit privy to some of that data, and it hasn't changed that much. And what they looked at is students who've left STEM disciplines, um, and unfortunately, in many cases, leave the university completely. And they, they, they surveyed, I want to say, about 12 to 15 campuses um, and they asked these students why they left. And just in short, what they found was these students of color, I'm sorry, I should have said students of color, these students weren't leaving because they were failing. A lot of them were leaving that because they didn't feel like they belonged. They couldn't identify with the culture of the discipline. So you were losing students who were getting A's and B's and passing grades and who could have fully gone on and been a productive whatever in science. But just because we've created this chilly climate they decide, you know what, this is not really for me. I'll go find something that actually speaks to my interests. So it sounds like a really um, 
simple concept, the idea of feeling like you're belonging to something, but it has far-reaching implications. Um, I try not to make any assumptions about my students or any one of them, whether they're of color or not of color, because I know as somebody who is an international person of color, the way I handle these situations might be very different to somebody who was born and raised here as an African American. All right? I chose resilience throughout my own career. I kind of chose to step aside and you know, see, it, see the world for what it is, as V.S. and I, Paul would say, and, and say, look, you know, this is what I want to do, and I'll figure out how to move the pieces to make that happen. I've seen others look at this and say, look, man, you know, you white folk could kind of go and do that. I'll go back to the stuff that actually makes sense to me. And uh, it is challenging to design a, 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 a campus experience that speaks to all of these nuances. You typically get a lot of these knee-jerk reactions. Um, I'm not trying to be dismissive of these things. Um, they all have their place and they all have value. But a lot of times they still, they still subscribe to a very deficit model. All right, you're unhappy, let me give you something. You know, look, now that you have that something, I've done my job and we're done. And we fall into that trap when we hire a couple of faculty of color or build a multicultural center or celebrate MLK Day. And there's a sense in which we're, okay, we did it. Now what else do you want? <laughs> and it, it uh, what's her name? Estella Ben Simon talks about the representation model, right? So this idea that as long as you have the the optics, <laughs> all right, you have that United Colors of Benetton feel to your campus, <laughs> then you've done the hard work. And uh, what I'm going to pass over to my, my colleagues to talk about is there's more to inclusion than just that, all right? I will unpack a bit more of my own scenario um, at my talk this afternoon, not to put a shameless plug here, but.